Well, welcome everybody. Welcome to Moon Age History on Tap Series. This is our fifth year. I just read more about that. Uh, my name is Mike Williams. Ashley Levine on my left. Again, I want to thank Moody's for uh, hosting this again. A special thanks to uh, Jeff Arden for uh, the sound system. We felt it the first time we did it out there. I thank all of you for coming out here in such miserable weather. I think this is the all of the history on Cap Series that you've done. This is by far the worst weather. But I do a reminder every time uh, this is a discussion, not a lecture. I, I don't like lecture <laughs> people. But the bar remains open throughout. But we are filming, so try not to spend too much time on front of please, between us. And we do have tees, sweatshirts, and books for sale here. Plus, we have a donation box. Museum desperately needs a new roof. Any donation would be greatly appreciated. But our subject today is um, the lost towns of Puchichin. But before I start on that, we start on that, I think you little demographics about Puchichin County. Uh, it separated from Itasca County in 1906. The Puchichin County consists of 3,154 square miles or two million acres. Uh, that's larger by far than the state of Rhode Island and Washington D.C. combined. It's even larger than the state of Delaware. Uh, there's some confusion as to how it got its name. Uh, some say it, it's a Jewish of course, but it came from uh, their uh, the phrase "the lake of the mists," with all the mists rising from the 20 foot drop that we had between many lake and many river. But another interpretation is uh, the lake lying parallel over a neighbor lake, meaning Cabotoga. On the old canoe road, uh, the Indians and then, of course, the Voyagers could take either. The population of Kuchin County now is uh, just a hair over 12,000, but that's down 6,000 from uh, 1960. So if you do the math and you divide up uh, 12,000 residents and 3,000 uh, square miles, we each got about a Quarter mile each. But I tell people not to get too excited because uh, around 10,000 years ago, Wichita County was covered with uh, by uh, glacial lake agencies. 90% of the county was. And when it receded, uh, there was a lot of peat left over. So the vast majority of the county is not inhabitable. And uh, we'll get to that later. <coughs> One of the things that we thought was sort of important to clarify was the difference between towns versus townships versus unorganized territories versus cities because they're all very different. So historically in the state of Minnesota, like the way that they have written Minnesota law, they've interchangeably used town and township. But a town is actually the correct term for an organized governmental unit, whereas a township is what you would refer to a geographical area. Now, in county areas where they don't have an organized governmental unit, you would refer to that as the unorganized territories. Now, towns are also different from cities. They're different in the way that they run. Um, towns have town boards. They don't have a city council with a mayor. The town boards, um, they're made up of supervisors and residents. The residents are referred to as electors. And towns have very strict rules in the way that they operate. Um, they, it's dictated that when they have an annual town hall meeting, it's held on a very specific day every single year. So it might be like the second Tuesday in March. And all towns have to have their annual town hall meeting on that specific day. Now, there are some, there is some leeway. They might have like other days that they could maybe hold it if there's a reason why they can't have it on that day. but. You know, they, there's very specific rules on to how they work. Now, a city, on the other hand, you have a city is designated either being a home rule charter city or a statutory uh, city system, which we have examples of both in Kuchichang County. Um, of course, they have a city council with a mayor. They all are elected. They have designated terms and rules that they do to work with the city. They have their little committees and things that they do. Um, and these cities are broken into four different types of cities within the state of Minnesota, four different classes. So you have class one, class two, class three, and class four. 
most of the cities in Minnesota are class four cities, and that's based on population. So a class four city is a city that has a population no greater than 10,000 people. Now cities and townships, they cannot, they have different amounts of power in whether or not they can exist or not. A township, they can vote to dissolve, but at the same time, the county can come in and just say, we're gonna pick you up and you don't exist anymore. A city works a little bit differently and most cities typically don't dissolve. You see cities that are actually forming, not dissolve. So Kuchiching County is unique in the way that we are the only county in the entire state of Minnesota that has zero townships. And a lot of people wonder why. That's one of the questions that they get at the courthouse quite frequently. Why don't we have townships in Kuchiching County? What happened to them? Why did they dissolve? So we're going to get into that, but to talk about why the dissolution takes place, we have to travel back 30 years before dissolution even starts happening, and we have to go back to 1903 when ditching fever takes hold in northern Minnesota. So if you don't know what ditching fever is, it's the process of judicial ditching, which is the greatest financial fiasco that Kuchiching County has ever taken part in. Um, it, it's absolutely ridiculous. So the premise behind the idea of judicial ditching was that we could drain our swamplands and settlers would flock to our area, they would prosper, and they would bring the much needed human interaction to facilitate the two things that Kuchiching County needed the most. They needed growth and they needed to enlarge the tax base because there's absolutely pretty much nobody here in 1903. So in 1906, people start coming in because of everything that's happening with the mill, so they think this is prime time to start getting into judicial ditching. And, but our local government, they don't really have any money to do this. So they're short of cash, and they decide that they're going to borrow the much needed capital to work on this project, to dig these ditches through the public bonding process. With the idea that when all of these people come in and they start homesteading and they're proving up these farms, they're going to have this increase in property taxes and they're going to pay off the bonds. Newsflash, this does not happen at all. Um, I mean, there's a lot of crazy things that happen between 1906 and basically 1917 to 1919 when judicial ditching comes to a full stop. People start getting sued, they go to prison. Our wonderful Minnesota governor, Governor Brinquist, he comes and he forcibly removes three county commissioners and our county auditor from their positions. There's money embezzlement happening. Um, and surprisingly, by 1919, Kuchiching County was in debt by $1.9 million. When I say $1.9 million, that's 1919 value. So if you take into account inflation, in 2022 value, that's $30,619,872.83. So if you're ever upset about your tax dollars being spent the way they are today, you would probably have just lit yourself on fire in 1919 because it was a really bad deal. When they did judicial ditching, um, they had used over 700,000 acres to do this project. Um, but only 14,000 acres had actually been improved. What they did was they basically just destroyed county land. Um, when you were doing the judicial ditching process, they were draining the water tables, which put in a huge increase for fires. So Kuchiching County was seeing more fires happening. It was destroying timber property, so the timber sales were not that great, trees were dying. And it's a peat swamp, so you're not really able to farm it in the first place, and you were just destroying the land value. So they had to figure out now, instead of digging ditches, they had to dig themselves out of $1.9 million worth of debt. So how are they gonna do this? They had some minor things that were happening from 1919 until 1929. Kuchiching County was put on a spending freeze of roughly $70,000 per year that was mandated by the state of Minnesota. But in 1929, the Red Lake Game Refuge was created specifically to help out Beltrami, Kuchiching, and Lake of the Woods counties. Um, because we're just like this three stooges up here that got suckered into this program and really got horribly burned by it. I mean, Kuchiching County was in a lot of trouble. And so Kuchiching County puts in 330,000 acres into the Red Lake Game Refuge. And this becomes the Pine Island State Forest. 
And when the Pine Island State Forest is created, there are 14 county or 14 townships that are affected in this northwestern section of the county. And this is important to remember for later what happens. But the benefit to creating this refuge is that the state of Minnesota then assumes two and a half million dollars of their collective bond debt from those three counties, which helps minimally relieve some of that debt that they're being afflicted with from the judicial decision process. So in 1933, though, more of these bonds come due. So the state of Minnesota makes a law for the 11 impacted counties to now start dissolving any township that met one of the following criteria. They had to have an assessed valuation of less than 50,000, a tax delinquency of 50% of its assessed valuation, state ownership of 50% of the real estate, that those 14 townships that are now in a state forest, or a tax delinquency that exceeded 70% in any one year, which is everybody. So that following year, in January of 1934, a motion was made and carried by the Cushing County Commissioners instructing the county auditor to draft a proposal that was being sent to all of the organized townships, instructing them that they needed to submit their own proposals to their voters to now vote to uh, disorganize and discontinue their townships. What's interesting is that when townships begin to dissolve, the county was taking a risk in having to absorb the responsibility of caring for those townships if they cease to exist. They still have to take care of these people in the middle of nowhere. So the next thing that's interesting that happens just a couple months later is that in April of the same year, the resettlement program starts. And so the Resettlement Administration was established as part of the Federal Emergency Relief Administration. And what they wanted to do, this was for re rural rehabilitation. So when the Homestead Act happened, that's how we got a lot of people up here to go live in a swamp in the middle of nowhere where they couldn't sustain themselves. Um, they had 525,000 families that were on government relief or welfare. And they wanted to figure out how to get rid of all of these people and move them to places where they could be more self-sufficient. So there was a significant amount of families on welfare. This was killing the state's income. It was extraordinarily painful for Kuchichin County to continue to pay for these people. So they allocated $270,000 to Kuchichin, Lake of the Woods, and Roseau Counties for relocating 306 farm families. In doing that, if they could get rid of these people, it would eliminate roughly $100 a year annually just in welfare costs. And then there's also the maintenance of those townships. So a lot of these people were just like, all right, bye. So they leave. And many of the areas that were mostly deserted due to relocation included Rapid River, Fairland, Klein, White Birch, Henry, Big Falls. And when I say Big Falls, I mean Big Falls, the township, not Big Falls, the city, because there were two of them and Gowdy Townships. So then in July of 1934, um, it was formally declared by the county commissioners that Rapid River and Klein, so they, people had dispersed from Rapid River and Klein, and there were so few people left, they had voted to just completely formally dissolve. And then Silverdale had done the same thing, because they had just so few people. Um, but this sets the wave for the rest of the dissolutions of townships to kind of follow. People just start leaving, they're not able to take care of their townships. Each one of them has their own story. But then by 1945, a final resolution was passed by the Kuchichin County Board of Commissioners declaring that it was absolutely necessary for the dissolution of all of the rest of the townships within Kuchichin. So at that point, they no longer had a choice. And some of them do fight this, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit, but that was basically the end of townships by 1945. Exactly. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about actually our first town or our first city in this whole area, uh, Ray Lake City. Uh, gold was discovered on Little American Island, probably about six, seven, eight miles uh, east of where we're sitting right now. In 1893, that uh, by 1894, a lot of people, a lot of miners, prospective millionaires, of course, uh, were moving into the area, and the town of uh, Rainy Lake City was platted in, like I said, 1894. 
And then shortly after, the village of Bernie Lake City was incorporated. It was a regular city. It had everything that a, a normal city would have. It had general stores, hardware stores, school, old butcher shop, a newspaper, uh, many, many saloons. Uh, and <laughs> many, many, many saloons. But uh, one thing that it uh, really didn't have was enough gold to keep it going. By 1901, the city uh, started turning the glowstone. And the Kuchichin County was created in 1906. Pretty Lake City that uh, was already gone. It was no more. It became uh, Kuchichin County's first glowstone. It actually, where the hell was he on for it? <laughs> So a lot of people ask where Hannaford is, and Hannaford was a town site that was established, but it was never really developed. So it was about four miles east of Bowman and a half mile west of the mouth of the Big Fork River. And it was started in 1892. And there were just these three guys from Wisconsin, they were lumbermen, and they came to the Rainy River country because they wanted to plot a town site. And these three men, their names were Eugene Shepard, Giles Cohen, and Thomas Dockery, and they thought that this place was going to be freaking awesome. And so they gave the name, uh, the town of Hanford, that name, in honor of some Wisconsin newspaper man. Um, I'm sure he's very proud that he had this town named after him because it didn't happen at all. Um, and so they created these they, they established their boundary lines, and they had all these lots and subdivisions. They planned out all the roads, where everything was going to go. They were going to have four railways that were just all going to converge on Hanford. Like, it was just going to be this tiny little mecca in the middle of nowhere. And this, it just for them, it just wasn't going to work. But they created this large promotional map to just sell this to people. So once they were done, they go back to their offices in Duluth and they just start promoting, 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 promoting. And somehow people bought this. They thought that this was going to work and people were buying all of these lots. And so business was really good for a while and they were getting people like school teachers, office girls, um, just small time speculators to buy all these lots. But then it started to get really hard because people realized that the railway wasn't coming. And without the railway, you're not going to have any type of industry that's going to be sustainable there. If there's no industry, there's no reason to live in a place where you can do nothing. You have no jobs. There's just nothing there for you. So these gentlemen started to lose a significant amount of money. And they realized that they had just simply come too early to this area and applied in the wrong location. It just wasn't anymore. So Hannaford just sort of gets turned back over to the wilderness for a while, and then a short time later, there's some more people that venture off, and they find out that this place exists, and they think, oh, this is really nice. Let's set up a sawmill. It's close to the river. There's lots of trees. And so more people come back to Hannaford. Hannaford has like this like second revival, like a phoenix rising that lasts like five years. And so they set up a portable sawmill there on the, on the banks of the river, between the town site and then there's another farm, it's the Dave Reedy farm, just on the other side. The Dave Reedy farm is probably like a half mile from Hannaford. And Dave Reedy's like super jacked that these people are going to be there having this sawmill. And then they build a hotel and there's people working and Dave Reedy's like the only farmer there. So he's just selling all of this stuff. He's, he's having a great time. And this two-story hotel and a few houses are being built there just after the turn of the century to support all of these workers. And the sawmill goes under several different ownerships before it's finally acquired in 1907 by Andrew Lindvall. And Andrew Lindvall is the founder of the Lindford community. Um, so he operated that sawmill for several seasons. Then in 1908, they get another boost, sort of. And this guy named Mr. Hembaugh, but he brought in another tiny little mill and he was going to manufacture broom handles. And it didn't go very well because he wanted the broom handles to be sawed in a very specific manner. They had to have like just the right curvature regardless of the wood. Like it didn't like even if the wood was not perfect at all. Nope, it has to be sawed this particular way. 
that didn't work for him. So he ends up folding his mill after maybe a year, he only has it. And then in 1910, the sawmill that was operated by Mr. Lindvall, that was its final season of operation. So when Lindvall closes his sawmill, everyone in Hannaford just left. So just this town died. So that was the end of Hannaford. It was very short-lived. I know. <laughs> okay, now it's my turn. You ready? Yes. Are you? Well, let's take a, let's take a deep <laughs> breath and try it. Okay. I think we're good. Yeah! <laughs> Congrats. Thanks. I'm going to talk about three towns, so it's, it's going to be a large chunk of Corey. So prepare yourself. The first town we're going to talk about is Bridgie. Bridgie is old and it lasted a relatively long time, but it wasn't official until uh, 1902. So there was a survey done in 1893. They were uh, looking for good places to put roads throughout the county. And so they were just doing a survey and these survey people came to the what was going to become the Bridgie Township area and there just happened to be uh, 30 squatters, that's what they called them in their report. Um, but uh, two years later during the census, they platted the area and there's eight people on the original plat map and their notes were they had comfortable cabins and clearings. That is the only information known about Bridgie Township mm -hmm. in the 1890s. It was comfortable and there were a lot of clearings and there's eight people. <laughs> and then it burned really bright and really hot for a really short amount of time after that. So after the 1895 census, people started moving in because they also wanted comfortable cabins and clearings. <laughs> <laughs> so a notable family that came in was the Moore family. They had several children, but the most notable of the children was Bridget, Bridgie. So when she came in, she wanted to establish this township as a proper township. So she wrote an application in 1895 to have a post office established in their area. It took just a month for her application to go through. And it, she signed it Bridgie Moore, but she wanted the post office to be called the Moore Post Office because she wanted the place to be called the Moore Township. Apparently, the people who read the application didn't read the entire thing, just saw Bridgie and went with it. And that's how the name Bridgie was born. <laughs> so she was the first postmaster of Bridgie. She was postmaster until 1899, and then one of her brothers took over for two months, and then another brother took over for about a month, and then for the next six months, they didn't have a postmaster at all, so they wouldn't get any mail for six months. So it was a little touch and go at the beginning. Um, it was in 1900 when Charles W. Field came in and took over the post office and he was officially assigned by the county to care for this post office and then that's when things started getting better. People were getting their mail. But it was eventually moved eight years later to Orth for whatever reason. The post office in Bridgie just wasn't working in that spot so they moved it to Orth. But the local people in Orth we're still calling it the Bridgie Township, or the Bridgie Post Office. So when you look up stuff, like where was the, all these post offices, there's several Bridgie Post Office, because everyone just kept calling it the same thing no matter where they moved it. <laughs> in the 1900s, the very early 1900s, that's when it burned bright and hot. People came in, they were building hotels, there was logging operations in the area. So it was a very promising township. There was saloons, there was bars, I'm sure there was prostitutes, there was a school that was what? built. Prostitutes, yeah. That wasn't there, me. That wasn't me. And a lot of like noble, for lack of better words, educated people were moving themselves to Bridgie as well. So there was law offices put in and a lot of well-to-do people who were investing their entire lives into this one single township and it didn't, didn't work really because in 1904, North Home showed up and it's like 
Bridgie said a joke in a crowded room, and then North Home said it louder, and everyone <laughs> thought they were really funny. So when North Home came in, everyone was just like, wow, look at this shiny new place, and then they just left Bridgie. So everyone went to North Home, even the newspapers. There was a lot of newspapers in Bridgie. There was three of them. There was the, uh, the Bridgie Record, the Bridgie News, and the Bridgie Broadaxe. And as soon as North Home showed up, they moved, they moved their offices to North Home and changed their names to the North Home Record, the North Home News, and then Broadaxe just folded. But, so Bridgie went from being the most documented, the most populated, the most exciting town in the southwest corner of Kuchichin to just being like the red-headed stepchild that everyone forgot about. <laughs> so, Where's uh, Bridgie today? Gone. Totally. That's why I'm talking about it. Totally. Right? <laughs> yeah, so... When, hey, I'm trying to fix stuff over here. I'm not a program yet. No, they didn't go away completely. So when North Home came about in 1904 and everyone moved there, there was a few people who held on to Bridgie and they were diehard Bridgie people. And they kind of just existed as just a loose group of people that were loyal to Bridgie until 1933, when all of the the uh, was dissolving these townships, all the stuff Ashley was talking about, Bridgie fell under that. They did not have many assets. They couldn't pay all of their taxes. There was like three people. So out of here. Yeah. Right here. So Kuchiching was just like bye bye, and Bridgie said, I don't think so. So some of those notable educated people who had originally moved to Bridgie, their families obviously had ties in Bridgie, so a lot of lawyers from North Home came back to help out Bridgie when they wanted to fight the county. So they got together with uh, Pine Top, and yeah, Englewood, and Evergreen. Those four cities, or townships, they got together, they got a lawyer, and they took Cushing County to court. And they lost miserably. <laughs> They, they made it to the Supreme Court of Minnesota mm -hmm. under the grounds that the dissolution of townships was unconstitutional because they didn't give them enough notice. There was too short notice that the $50,000 in assets was arbitrary, but for a town that didn't even have $7,000 in assets, I feel like any number could be arbitrary. <laughs> <laughs> so under those complaints, they took that to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court just laughed in their face and said, you don't exist anymore, sorry, it's very constitutional, you have nothing to offer this county, and that was the end of Bridgie in 1948, that was their death sentence. Yes? How close is Bridgie to It was, uh, I don't know the exact miles, but on a map, it's very, very close. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so like, and like a little dash mark thing. It's only like one of them. It's like, <laughs> like half an inch between them on the map. Most in North Home? Yeah. Yes, yeah. This is in the southwest corner of the county. Not anymore, but it was. Yeah. Um, there was a few not so great things that happened in, in Bridgie. I mean, other than the fact that they didn't do well. When I was flipping through newspapers, there was a man who was hit by a train. That made the newspaper. That was probably the most exciting thing that happened in Bridgie. Um, he, his head got crushed. He fell asleep on the tracks because he was walking home from a bar in Bridgie, and he decided to take a nap on the tracks. And the conductor of the train saw a thing, thought it was coal, honked the whistle, or honked the whistle, blew the whistles and it didn't move. So he's like, oh, it must just be coal from a different train. And they got like five feet from this mass, realized it was a man, but it's a train, so you can't just stop it. And it hit him and it dragged him quite a while. And it crushed half his head and he lived. Oh, yeah. <laughs> For the next three hours. <laughs> he lived long enough to die somewhere else. So. That's Bridgie. So now we're going to move on to a much happier place. <laughs> happy land. Happy. Yes. Yeah. Not happy town, happy land. Is it really? Yes, it was called happy what? land. Yes. Yeah. And a lot of people at the time were asking that because there was a train station at happy land. And when people like in the cities were like, oh, I need a ticket to happy land. 
the ticket counter people were just like, that's funny. It's a nice joke. Yeah. And so people were just like, no, I desperately need to go to Happy Land. And they're just like, me too, pal. <laughs> but, yeah, so that is it's a true story about Happy Land. It's like people struggle to get tickets there because a lot of people out of the county didn't know it was a real place. <laughs> yeah. So Happy Land came about in 1904. Well, that was before it was Happy Land. Then it was just normal land and people were living there. They had homesteads. It became Happy Land in 1907 when construction crews for railroad companies were working on a rail line near uh, Big Falls. And they were kind of working their way up. And they would walk from wherever they were working to Littleport to go to the bars and have like a nice weekend out. And on their way, obviously, Cushing County is a lot of bogs, except for in Happy Land. So as they're walking, mosquitoes are terrible, it's foggy, it sucks, they can't wait to get to Little Fork and get drunk. And then they get out four miles south of Little Fork, there's just this patch of area that's high pine land, so it's not foggy, so mosquitoes aren't that bad there. So they get there and they're just like, oh, thank goodness, it's Happy Land. <laughs> and so it was just a joke and it stuck and the township became Happy Land. And it was a very happy land for about 30 years when they had the train station there. Um, it, the train station obviously didn't last the, super long, but um, <laughs> yeah. So for a really short time, it was a very, very happy land. And then they were dissolved in 1935 when Kuchina said goodbye. Because it was not a big place, so they just didn't, they didn't have the money, they didn't have the numbers, and happy land became goodbye land. <laughs> And that's Happy Land. There's not much. There's not much to tell. And then we move on to Craigville. Craigville has a lot to tell, <laughs> and it probably has the most interesting story behind its name. Uh, there was a man named Craig. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Craigville. There was a man named Craig. Apparently, he was cool enough to have his town named Craigville. And that was in 1913. So that survived from 1913 to 28. The interesting thing about Craigville, other than its name, is that it's unlike all of the towns that we're talking about tonight because it was never official. It, it was just a place. Imagine a bunch of fraternity guys started partying in a field and they just stayed for 20 years. <laughs> that was Craigville. There was no government. It was never an official township. Right here! <laughs> Rainier at least cleaned up. <laughs> kind of. So, yeah, it was just, it was a 20 year bender, Craig Bill was. <laughs> Rainier! Yeah, literally just a 20 year bender. It, it survived as long as the, the lumber industry survived. That's where its people came from. It was mostly single lumberjacks who were passing through for all the logging camps around it. There was also a railroad camp right outside of Craig Bill. There was a, uh, a terminus for the Minnesota and Rainy River line. So a lot of people go through Craigville, but not a lot of permanent people. In a season, it was reported that anywhere between, like up to 20,000 people could pass through Craigville and give it business. And the main business in Craigville were B&Bs, booze and booze. <laughs> there was a lot. Like I said, not a lot of permanent people, so bars were always opening and closing, opening and closing, but at any given time, they averaged around 20 saloons. And they kept around 5,000 people at one time. So if you walk into Craigville at any given time, there's usually about 5,000 lumberjacks in Craigville using those 20 bars. And each bar had women to offer all of the men because they're single guys or they're just away from their wives, however that works. Um, and the bars I found interesting, the names, just like Craigville, it's a very straightforward, they very straightforward names, they're not very creative. You had places like A. Charlie's, Broken Ass Foley's, <laughs> James Reed's Bar, very plain Jane name, names, just like the prostitutes, A. Charlie's Wife, Starface <laughs> Jean. <laughs> Very to the point, and I find that very funny about Craigville. They were exactly who they said they were. They did not pretend to be anything other than a party. 
it was also pretty much illegal. All of Ooh. the existence of Pikeville was illegal because they existed during Prohibition. They didn't exist before Prohibition and they didn't exist after Prohibition. <laughs> so everything they did was very illegal and the county records, the, the court records, at least once a week there was someone from Craigville who had to appear in court. So everyone knew where Craigville was at and it was happening, which Craigville was in the southeast border of the county. So yeah, Craigville. There were a few families because you know prostitutes have kids sometimes. So <laughs> there is a yeah, so, yeah. So there's about 400 permanent residents, and there was enough kids that they did build a school for them. But other than that, it was just like this really long fever dream filled with just a bunch of Trump dudes. What was the name of that school? <laughs> what was what? The name of that school? Fredville Elementary. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who my dad is. <laughs> That's, that's Craigville. That's the standout because it was not even it was not even real, really. It was just there. <coughs> Alright, now you won't hear from me for the rest of the night. Thank you. <laughs>
potential boundaries of this new city so we could get enough people. We finally ended up with uh, 13. And the city had been capacity to uh, get to 2,224 acres of mainland, islands, and lake. It was 13 people voted at cabin number one by the Deer Lodge on the 27th of October, 1939. So the city of the, the village of the city of the Deer was incorporated in the polls of the Glass, of course, got their liquor licenses. But not everybody was happy. Don Johnson worked for Gloria Melbourne at the time over at Redcrest, and uh, he was a little upset because he thought his taxes Guys, which he probably did a little bit, but he was a multi-millionaire and it's obvious he was a little on the tight side. <laughs> but uh, the village uh, began to grow. Highway 11 was built, uh, lake property was becoming great in demand. Uh, Highway 11 was expanded with the bridge to uh, to the Dove Island at Che Che Resort with, uh, in, in the year 1950. The population at that time was, uh, or excuse me, in 1980, was 108 people. Our family, Mary and I and our two girls, moved to Island View to the Thunderbird Lodge in April of 86. And at that time, I was immediately appointed to the city council with the departure of uh, Mr. Lepper, who moved away. And then several months later, the existing mayor, current mayor, Bill Alexander, moved, and I was uh, voted mayor by the city council. And I was re-elected uh, twice, both times uh, without uh, opposition. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> there were people out there, very serious people that were opposed to the city. We could say they didn't like that extra layer of government and the, some of the kind of silly ordinances that the city had passed before I got there. But the big reason that they were upset with the city is the roads. We had probably the Cambridge individual Residence is the, the highest the highest taxes in Kuchin County, and undoubtedly the worst roads. But the city did not have the resources to uh, improve those roads unless uh, unless we uh, had assessments on our houses and the taxes really really would have gone up. The only other option was to dissolve the city and go back to the county. Uh, liquor licenses were no longer an issue because. Uh, the state of Minnesota, starting with uh, actually the Kettle Falls Hotel in uh, 19, St. Louis County in 19, uh, let's see, I'm losing it here on the date, 1975, Kettle Falls Hotel got the first, first seasonal liquor license, license number one. But anyway, there was a referendum held the purpose of keeping the city or dissolving the city in uh, mid 1991. And that particular vote tied 41 to 41. But it was found out that there was an ineligible voter. So those that were in opposition petitioned the state again, and another referendum was held on August 27th, 1991. And the city lost. The city lost by a vote of 55 to 53. Very, very close. And the official dissolution of the city then was <clears throat> a few months later, February 27th, 1992. So now Kuchichin County is in charge of uh, what used to be the city of Island View. But you know, there is something about, about uh, self rule. In fact, our country much uh, more to what we can rule ourselves. So we're in about 19. 96, for whatever reason, Wichichin County wrote a special use permit to Newman Brothers Construction out of Virginia, Minnesota to build a rock crushing plant. And possibly, it was also in the, in the motion to, uh, the resolution to uh, build an asphalt plant within the city of Island View, really close to where Mary and I live now, on the south side of the Highway 11, where the gravel pits used to be. It was a bad deal. Dynamiting, rock crushing noise, unbelievable dust from dawn to dark for months on end. Remember, Barb, uh, 
who was the, the Barb West, who was the superintendent of the Voyager's snowmobiling in the, in the Lost Bay Portage, and she said that she could see dust, dust layers, and the snow as far, that's 10 miles away, up there, and also could hear a pressure procedure going on. The residents became so upset that we had several meetings, and one of them, we filled up the, the Rainier uh, Community Building to capacity. But anyway, the roads didn't come. They didn't come. The rock crushing plant finally went away. At about 19, excuse me, about 2010, the county uh, put out the bids for the widening of the Harbor Lane. That goes from 138 to the house boats. That project was completed. And they finally went on and widened and, uh, and uh, put asphalt on County Road 138. So anyway, all is good now, and I, I hope they had that, uh, that, that special use permit has, has uh, expired where they don't start up that plan again. If they do, they can all be held real great close. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's what I've got now. Other than a, I've got a little trivia here. You already know how Happy Land uh, got its name, but does anybody know how Den Table township got its name? It was named after three, three of the settlers. Do you know somebody who knows it? Well, I don't know their name, but Dennis, Taylor, and... Taylor, Bowman, and the dent is something. Yeah, Demars. Demars, Taylor, and Bowman. But how about Linford? Everybody knows where Linford was. We mentioned uh, Andrew, Andrew uh, Lindwall before. <laughs> well, this is kind of strange, but the man by the name of uh, Andrew Lindwall lived there, but he named it after himself. He, he was impressed with the Ford car, so that's how Lind Ford was named. And another one's not so exciting, Ray, Hotel and Ray. Named after Ray Cook, who was an executive of the railroad. But anyway, we appreciate some questions. I have a question. Okay, we have a question to my left here. Of all these towns, are there still remnants there? Like, are there foundations or falling down buildings or anything in any of the towns? Well, Peggy's, Peggy's question is, uh, is there anything, any remnants left of these towns? Uh, undoubtedly, you know, the woods were encroached and, and uh, covered up everything. Places like St. Myers, you know, which is the township, the only thing that's really left of St. Myers is the, the town hall that they have, which is owned now by their, their farmers organization. And that's probably the same thing with Cross River. So there, there is some identity by the residents, but of course the townships are done. And if you look at your tax statements, it's unorganized, it says, just like mine does now. I think most of the, like, the remnants would be found in the people. Like for Bridgie, a lot of people in North Home claim Bridgie as part of their history just because of how close they were, and a lot of people, like I said, went from Bridgie to North Home. So I think in a lot of cases, it's more like in the people, not so much. I don't think there's a lot of structure left in most of but aren't there, like, in uh, Craigville, isn't there remnants? I don't think that there's much left in Craigville at there's all. Still people live but there's still people that are oh, out that way. It's the same thing with, like, Indus or Frontier. You know, a lot of those places where you there's settlements. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's the other thing, too, is that there's a difference with some of these places, like um, Wayland, for example, that was a settlement. So there's also just settlements that were in the county that aren't designated as like a township or a town or a city. They were just simply settlements. Yeah. Um, for example, like, yeah. Um, yeah. But, what if I wanted to take a boat out to Rainy Lake City or anything, and you like, well, Stephanie's asking if there's anything left to Rainy Lake City. <clears throat> I know there's wood chips there. No. <laughs> <laughs> But you can still see the, the street lines because of the wagon ruts. 
and, and there is there is one building that's left there, but that was uh, that was put up after the city ceased to exist. A, a small resort operated out of there in the 1930s. Evidence band has got. Then, but just a few years ago, the park purchased all the cabins that bordered the lake. Uh, this family made the bathtubs. Uh, after I went to work for the park in 2006, there is some evidence of you know, cement work and things like that. Plus, uh, lilac, you can see that's not native, you know, for us, but just lilac trees here. And there's elms. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, yeah, there's some ladies. pictures in Craigville and one of those images of the people sitting at the bar is used in the opening of Cheers. Sorry, it's 
Any, any other questions, I guess? <laughs> yep, over there. Are you going to do karaoke for us now? Are we going to do what? Sing karaoke for us now. Do you have your place? Here we go. Come on, you can do it. Here we go. I don't know how to squeeze. Good night. Anyone else? Can I go home now? Any other questions for the <laughs> <laughs>